give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Welcome back, my friends, to another episode of Faith Matters with Philip Campbell. This is a Catholic program broadcasting on Good Shepherd Catholic Radio in lovely Jackson, Michigan. And I'm your host, Philip Campbell, and for the next half hour, we're going to be talking about some some cool history. I hope I hope you enjoy history. That is my thing. That's my specialty. I, I don't impose it upon you all all the time here, but sometimes I like to. And uh, on our recent, our, our most recent program, we were talking about the Irish missions. We were talking about the conversion of Ireland. We talked about St. Patrick and some of the great saints uh, that came in the wake of Patrick, like St. Bridget, St. Enda, St. Brendan the Voyager. And we're going to continue today now talking about the golden age of the Irish missions and specifically about how Christianity started to spread from Ireland and come into Britain, come into Scotland, and then into uh, England proper during the 6th and 7th centuries. So we're going to start back, though, in Ireland. We talked about that there is a group of individuals known as the Twelve Apostles of Ireland. And the Twelve Apostles are, of Ireland are, uh, are a, group of, uh, a group of saints who whose uh, missions in Ireland and abroad were so influential that they have been accorded the special title of the, uh, of the Twelve Apostles of, of Ireland. Uh, they are monastic saints who uh, made very important contributions uh, to the growth of Catholicism. Most of them were students of the great uh, St. Finian of Clonard. Um, uh, and one of these uh, Twelve Apostles is St. Finian of Movila, uh, who founded one of the great monasteries in Ireland. St. Finian uh, lived in the late 6th century, died in the year 589. And Finian is important because he composed a rule for one of his, for his monastic foundations. This was generally, um, this was before Benedictine monasticism had come to Ireland. So uh, Finian's rule is one of the first, first rules of monastic life in Ireland, and it's how we know a lot about how Irish monasticism looked. He also wrote a penitential, and a penitential was a book prescribing penances for certain sins because the Irish monks were very famous confessors, and it's to them, actually, that we owe the practice of private confession. Many of you might not know, but in the early church, like in the first few centuries, confession was public. If you committed a serious sin, you confessed, you confessed it publicly before the bishop in front of the entire church, and the bishop absolved you publicly and gave you a penance publicly. So the whole, the whole process of sin and reconciliation was public. Now, uh, for various reasons, the Irish confessors thought that it would be better to make these make confessions private. And so if you don't like the idea of having to confess your sin publicly in front of the entire congregation, my friend, you can thank the Irish confessors of the early Middle Ages, especially St. Finian. So Finian was famous for writing this monastic rule. He was famous for his penitential and his monastery of Movila, but he was also a famous uh, author and artist he was an illuminator, that is, he had been trained in the art of illumination. Illumination was the art of decorating manuscripts or of writing manuscripts beautifully in these ornate, uh, these ornate characters, decorating the manuscript with, with beautiful color and art. He produced a particularly renowned edition of the Psalms known as St. Finian's Psalter. Now, one of the disciples of Finian was a young Irish monk known as Columba. Columba came from the O'Neill tribe of Northern Ireland, and he was a talented young monk, but also very ambitious and impetuous. Columba wanted to start his own monastery, and so after some years with St. Finian, he said, I'm gonna go off and start my own monastery. St. Finian said, that's great. And Columba wanted to make a copy of Finian's Psalter. Finian's Psalter, as I said, was very renowned as a beautiful, illuminated edition of the Psalms. But Finian did not like the sound of that. Finian's Psalter was extremely famous, and if Columba made copies of it, then that would, of course, detract from the value of the original. Finian didn't want it being duplicated, so he told Columba, I'm sorry, my son, you cannot copy this manuscript. But Columba disobeyed Finian. He made a copy of the Psalter secretly. He would sneak into the scriptorium by night and work on copying the Psalter against 
the directive of the abbot. But St. Finian eventually caught him, however, and ordered him to turn over the manuscript copy. Rather than do so, Columba fled with the incomplete manuscript. And this incomplete manuscript, by the way, would become known as the Kathach of St. Columba, and it still exists to this day. You can still see the, the, the copy of Finian's Psalter that Columba made. So Columba fled with the Kathach in hand, uh, fled back to his home territory, and Finian was irate. I mean, this this <laughs> this Psalter was the pride and joy of the monastery of Movila. He did not want it being copied, and so he got together a band of laymen from around the monastery and said, hey, somebody has copied our Psalter and they're making off with it. And so this band of laymen chased Columba to retrieve the Kathach, and they were armed also. They were armed in case he did not give it up willingly. So uh, Columba, knowing he was being pursued, fled to the clan O'Neill, which were his kinsmen, and they rallied to defend him. And so when Finian and his men arrived, they saw that Columba had also been reinforced by a band of armed men, and things got ugly, and there was a pitched battle called the Battle of Coldrim, or the Battle of the Book, which happened in 560. And it really spiraled out of control. Afterwards, when the battle was over, 3,000 men had been killed. The Unil had prevailed. Finian was unable to, uh, to divest Columba of the addition of the Psalter. But 3,000 people were killed, laying dead on the fields of Coldrim. It was just a horrible slaughter something that had started as an argument between monks and grown out of control. The church in Ireland held a synod after the battle to assign blame, and they said that Columba bore the blame. He was deemed guilty of the violence, and he was sent into exile from Ireland, sent into exile with the command that he win as many souls for Christ who had been lost in the battle. And so Columba left Ireland with a band of missionaries. He left never to look on his homeland again. That was part of his penance. Years later, when Columba was old and returned to Ireland for a council, he had to come back blindfolded because his penance was that he part of his penance was that he would never look on his homeland again. So when he wanted, when his presence was requested at a council, he wore a blindfold from the time he first came into Irish waters till he left. So he never actually looked on his homeland. But he left Ireland with a band of missionaries and landed on the Isle of Iona, which is a Scottish island in the Inner Hebrides, and there he established a monastery. Columba would labor in Scotland for the next 34 years to bring the people there to Christ, and the people of Scotland were called the Picts. Uh, he would become very successful and would eventually win the title the Apostle to the Scots. Iona would become a center of Celtic Christianity. You can still go to Iona today and see the Monastery of Columba. The structure that's there today is from the High Middle Ages, not Columba's original structure, but you can still still go visit it. And uh, the establishment of Iona and the spread of Christianity into Britain, into Scotland and Britain from there, meant that as, as Britain starts becoming Christianized, it's in the form of Christianity that the Irish practice. So they are getting introduced to Irish Christianity in particular with all its little eccentricities. By the way, I am, shameless plug time, I am somewhat of an expert on St. Columba. I've published a book, um, uh, published an edition of his biography written by St. Adamnon. If you want to look it up, you can uh, you can go online and look up the life of St. Columba as told by St. Adamnon by Philip Campbell. Uh, you can find it on Amazon or on lulu.com. But at any rate, Columba starts evangelizing the Picts. Uh, their most powerful king was a guy named King Brud, who lived, uh, whose, whose court was somewhere around the river Ness. Uh, and there's a great story about Columba and King Brud. Columba used to come to King Brud's fortress and preach to him. And Brud got, got tired of it. He, like Columba, had worn out his welcome. And so one day, Columba comes walking up the road, and King Brud's uh, men tell him, Your Majesty, that pest Columba is coming again to preach. And Brood said, oh no, lock the gates of the fortress. Tell him I'm not home. Just, just pretend I'm not here. So they lock the gates of the fortress and Columba comes up and they say, Brood's not here. He can't see you right now. And Columba says, I know you're in there, King Brood, and you are going to hear me. 
and he throws his hand up against the door and the doors fly open under the power of God and and Columba goes in and preaches to King Brood who's in terror of the saint who can fling the doors of his fortress open uh, uh, apparently uh, with nothing but his his words in his hand alone. We don't know if King Brood was won, or, won over to the faith or not. The details are kind of uh, sketchy, but, uh, but Columba did have great success in the Kingdom of the Picts. By the time he died in 597, Western Scotland had entered into a kind of golden age as the new faith was flourishing in, uh, in Western Scotland and the Isles. So it was from this monastery of Iona that Christianity starts permeating Scotland, and all these other saints start coming out of Iona. It became, it becomes like this, uh, like this breeding ground for for Irish saints who are spreading throughout uh, Scotland and England to evangelize the peoples there. About a generation after the death of Saint Columba, you have another monk from Iona, whose name was Saint Aidan, and Aidan traveled all the way across Scotland and founded a monastery on an island in the North Sea called Lindisfarne. Lindisfarne is, um, it's off the coast of what would today be like Yorkshire part of England in the uh, in the North Sea. And Lindisfarne uh, became a very renowned monastery in England, one of the first and most famous of the English monasteries. Uh, working with one of the newly converted Anglo-Saxon kings, Oswald of Northumbria, Aidan began bringing Christianity to the Saxons of northern England, who at that time were still pagans. He would go out from Lindisfarne, and he would walk, traveling village to village on foot, winning souls to Christ, uh, bringing Christianity to northern England. And again, the form of Christianity the English are receiving is Irish Christianity. That's going to be very important, because later there's going to be a dispute over whether England should follow all the Irish customs or whether they should follow the Roman customs. But one thing that Lindisfarne is very famous for is for its illuminated manuscripts. Just like Bridget had founded her school of illumination at Kildare, so Aidan founded a school of illumination in Lindisfarne. And uh, the Lindisfarne school of illuminators would, would produce some extremely famous pieces of Celtic illumination, and probably, I'd say, the most famous of all Irish illuminated Gospels is a book called the Lindisfarne Gospels, which is just a a perfect example of Irish illumination. If you look up the Lindisfarne Gospels, just look at the ornate work on the letters, these swirling uh, swirling Celtic knots that decorate uh, that decorate every letter, all this very intricate geometric design, floral patterns, animals, all this bright, vivid color. It's really astonishing, and, and one can only imagine the level of patience and skill that must have gone in to decorating these beautiful manuscripts. So fortunately, we are still in possession of the Lindisfarne Gospels. I say fortunately because the monastery of Lindisfarne, uh, about... Um, about a century and a half after it was founded, it was raided and destroyed by the Vikings. So it's very fortunate that this gospel of Lindisfarne survived. Now, I've mentioned a few times in these talks on the Irish missions that Irish monastic customs, Irish uh, practices were very different from Christianity elsewhere. Um, their monastic life was very different from what we're probably familiar with from the Benedictine rule. Monks were very independent in Irish monasticism. In Benedictine monasticism, a monk would pretty much be, he would be expected to stay in a certain monastery unless his superior sent him elsewhere. When a Benedictine monk entered a monastery, that was his home and he was expected to live and die there. Whereas Irish Irish monks were more itinerant, They, they stayed at a monastery learning under an abbot, and then when they you know, when their fancy struck them, they picked up and they might go to a different monastery. They were much more itinerant. They would go study under many different uh, famous abbots, pick up many different skills, maybe illumination, something like that. So they were very independent. The abbots, uh, like I said, the abbots were more influential than bishops, um, sometimes wielded more authority than bishops, but they didn't have as strict control over the lives of their monks. One thing that all contemporary uh, sources mention is that the Irish tonsures were shaved differently. The tonsure is like when the monk shaves a circle on the top of his head, right? Um, that was the Roman custom, but the 
the uh, the sources all say that the Irish monks shave their head in a triangle. And we don't know what that means exactly. Does that mean they shaved a triangle on the top of their head? Or does that mean they shaved everything but a triangular tuft of hair? We're not exactly sure. There's various statues um, that, that we think might give clues to what the Irish tonsure looked like, but it's a great matter of, of uh, debate. But probably one of the biggest differences in Irish Christianity was that the Irish celebrated Easter on a different date than all the other Latin, Latin churches. You see, the Irish, remember, the Irish got Christianity fundamentally from St. Patrick, essentially. Patrick had trained in Gaul, which is France, and the Gauls at that time were still using an old calendar that they had gotten from the Greeks. Um, but by the 5th century, the Gauls had started celebrating Easter around the same time as all the other churches did, as the Church of Rome did. And so what this meant is that by the time you get to the early Middle Ages, basically the Irish are the only people in the Latin Church who are celebrating uh, Easter at a different time than in Rome. And in the Middle Ages, like in the in the 7th century, there's this whole controversy called the Irish Easter Controversy, where the, the Roman Benedictine monks and the Irish monks have this huge dispute over what date we should be celebrating uh, Easter on. And it's eventually going to be resolved in favor of the Roman custom, which is why in the West we only have one date of Easter and not two. But yeah, basically, as the Irish monks continued to spread outside of Ireland, they would come in contact with Benedictines and other continental Christians who found the Irish customs kind of strange, thought the tonsures, the triangular tonsures were very weird, the itinerant monks were just very different from what the Benedictines uh, idealized, and so often you had conflicts and hostilities between the Irish monks and the Benedictines over uh, over their, their differing uh, customs. And what ultimately happened is uh, there, there got to be a lot of hostility in England between um, uh, monks like uh, like Saint uh, Saint Wilfred of Ripon, who was a Benedictine monk, uh, who uh, who opposed the Irish customs, and <clears throat> gradually this became such a dispute that the king uh, at the time, uh, King Oswu, had to call a synod at a place called Whitby in the middle of the seventh century, where he said, "Okay, we're going to hash this out. We're not going to have." two different types of Christianity where we're both fighting about the date of Easter, we all have to be on the same page here. And so the Irish monks came forward and they brought forward their arguments. They said, hey, Christianity in this country goes back to St. Columba. He celebrated Easter this way. We're just maintaining our traditions. And St. Wilfred and, uh, and the Benedictines said the same thing. And so in the end, uh, in the end, King Oswu said, is it true that Easter is celebrated on such and such date by the Pope in Rome? And both parties said yes. And he said, is it true that the Pope is the successor of St. Peter? And again, both parties said yes. He said, is it true that Jesus said to St. Peter, upon this rock I will build my church, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it? And again, both parties said yes. And then he turned to the Irish and said, was any such power given to St. Columba? And the Irish said, no, only to St. Peter. And then King Oswu said, well, very well, then we're going to go with the practice of Rome and, and the, the Pope, who has the authority of St. Peter. And that settled it. And then England, after that, adopted the, the Roman Benedictine customs. And that's, that's, how, uh, that's how the Irish Easter controversy was settled. But the Irish continued to spread even outside the British Isles. By the 8th century, the Irish monastic foundations had spread throughout Europe as far away as Austria. And even into central Italy, there was, there was one in Mecklenburg, which is in northern Germany by the Danish border. Uh, there was Irish monastic foundations in, in Salzburg. Uh, some of these foundations became very renowned. For example, the, Abbot, uh, or the Abbey of Bobbio in northern Italy was founded by St. Columbanus, who had actually converted the king of the Lombards. Bobbio would become a very important monastery with one of the most extensive libraries in northern Italy. St. Columbanus wanted to collect all of the various, uh, every book he could get his hands on. He wanted to turn Bobbio Monastery into a center of education learning, which it became for many generations. So they continued on. They continued to, to, to grow and spread uh, 
their monasteries and their um, their particular dedication to scholarship and the art of illumination for for several centuries into the into the uh, the, the the late seven hundreds and the eight hundreds. So, really, from the fifth to the ninth century, the Irish missionary monks steeped in the scriptures, masters of the art of illumination. They spread first throughout the British Isles and then to all of Western Europe to aid the continued conversion of that continent towards Christianity. Uh, I mean, Europe wasn't converted by the Irish. Europe was already in the process of converting when the Irish came, but the Irish just uh, facilitated that conversion. They contributed to it. They they re-energized it, brought a vital new spirit and energy into the Christian world in those centuries. And though their specific form of religious observance would in time disappear as it was supplanted by the Benedictine rule, their contributions to the development of Catholicism and the culture of the West truly cannot be overstated. And there's a there's a book called How the Irish Saved Civilization, which talks about these, these great Irish centuries, the Irish Golden Age, how they really spanned the gap between the, the old Roman patristic era and the high Middle Ages. What brought this Golden Age to an end? Well, ultimately, it was the, it was the Vikings, <laughs> because the, the Irish were very fond of, you know, the way they spread was by founding monasteries, and they founded monasteries on islands and along waterways, places that was easy to access. These monasteries, unfortunately, were also easy to plunder, and as the Vikings descended upon Europe in the late 8th century, they began by pillaging and destroying Lindisfarne, the, uh, the monastery of St. Aidan, and then they would go on to attack all these monasteries, uh, and eventually to conquer Ireland itself. Ireland was conquered by the Vikings and settled by them in the 10th and 11th centuries, which ultimately snuffed out the golden age of Irish Catholicism as we go into the High Middle Ages. But that, my friends, is another story. So we'll have to continue this another time. I hope this was edifying. I just, I just love the history of the Irish Church. It's very fascinating. I, I wish we could all, I wish we could spend 10 more episodes talking about it, really. Maybe we will. Maybe we will. But not today. Until next time, this has been Faith Matters with Philip Campbell. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. God bless you, my friends.